Welcome, everyone. Welcome, October. So nice to see so many um, familiar faces and also new faces. Um, this is the Intellectual Shaman Discussion Series hosted by the International Humanistic Management Association, also by the Galligan Chair of Strategy at Boston College um, with Sandra Waddock, who's here today and will very shortly be introducing our uh, guest, Dr. Phil Mervis. Um, I'm Erica Steckler from the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility at UMass Lowell. I'm also um, a, a member of the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, we have some other EMA folks here um, who I welcome you to say hello to um, either by chat or elsewhere. I'll be posting some information in the chat just to keep everyone on the same page. We are recording. Um, I guess the last thing I'd like to say is I'm so thrilled that we get to have these types of discussions. And I think one of the things we sometimes forget to say about the intellectual shamans, although maybe Sandra will highlight it, is it's really an opportunity to think carefully about the type of work we do um, or aspire to do as far as sort of matching that wisdom and healing piece. Um, so I always enjoy this series and I'm so glad that Phil is joining us today. With that, I think I'll hand it over to Sandra. Thanks, Erica. Um, so I was thinking about this session last night and realized I have known Phil for over 40 years, which kind of dates me, I guess, but that's <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> and you, yes. In fact, he was a faculty member when I joined the doctoral program at Boston University in 1980. So, um, so Phil, I'm going to just briefly introduce him and then I'm going to turn it over to him because he's going to um, going to talk to us um, through a slide show that he's invented. Um, so he's an organizational psychologist and he studies uh, uh, he, who studies in private practices concerning large scale organizational change the workforce and the workplace, and business leadership in society. He's an advisor to companies and NGOs on five con continents and has authored or edited 16 books, including, uh, I think what the first was, The Cynical Americans, Building the Competitive wor Workforce, um, one I really loved called To the Desert and Back, which was about the transformation of Unilever and other companies. And his latest are How to Do Relevant Research from the Ivory Tower to the Real World, and sustainability, sustainability to social change. Lead your company from managing risks to creating social value. Phil holds an MBA from Yale and a PhD in organizational psychology from the University of Michigan. He taught at Boston University, Shanghai Zhao Tong University and the London Business School um, and has visited as a researcher at the University of Pretoria and is a senior fellow in social innovation at the Lewis Institute at Babson College. Um, he's most known, though, for his organizational uh, development and uh, psychology work, and so I think that is the premise on which he's going to talk to us today. He wrote a prize-winning paper on consciousness raising um, and, and has done work involving theater and the arts, orchestrated rituals for merging companies, and done outdoor team building in the Rockies, the Pyrenees, the Alps, and the Himalayas, and has led corporate journeys and community service efforts in the urban US, Paris, London, Dubai, and Sao Paulo, in, in India, China, Greenland, Tanzania, and Vietnam, and among Aboriginal peoples in Borneo, Paraguay, and Australia. Um, plus, he's done a lot with multi-stakeholder dialogues on environments and other socioeconomic issues. So you can see he has a wide and very and varied and very interesting background. So Phil, um, with nothing more to say, I will, I'm, I'm sure I have lots more to say, but I will turn it over to you um, because I think what you have to say will be a lot more interesting than anything I have to say. No, I don't think so, Sandra. Let me see, this come up, come up okay on the screen? Yeah, that's good. Okay, great. Um, so thank you, uh, Sandra and uh, Erica, for uh, inviting me to join you. And uh, um, it's really nice to see some good old friends in the audience, and well as some uh, people whose names I recognize and some I look forward to meeting. Um, thank you for mentioning our latest book to uh, sustainability and social change. And the theme of this one is uh, sort of <clears throat> to the extent we think of traditional definitions of sustainability, it's sort of do 100% less harm. 
uh, what, what does it mean to get engaged uh, to do uh, more good? And uh, it's not the only book in this space, but it's a, it's a fun one. Um, today, it's kind of a blast from the past. I'm going to talk uh, about uh, developing globally responsible leaders. And it's a slideshow, picture show, not a heavy on content. Let's see how I advance this. I got it. Okay. So the starting point is this, is if in my lifetime, uh, you get various lists of the greatest CEOs in business. And, um, these are the usual suspects. All of them gifted business leaders. Uh, most of them, uh, at least uh, whom I've met or uh, I heard about vicariously, miserable human beings. And then we know there's leaders like this, the world's most admired leader, uh, Nelson Mandela, where uh, as he frames it, it's not just about your external factors uh, that define your progress as an individual, but your internal factors. So uh, when I got started uh, fresh out of college, uh, BA, not an MBA, I'd never studied business, but I did get hooked up with these two real guys, Ben and Jerry. And uh, it was a wild ride helping them to develop their business and to watch them grow as people and leaders. And in that context, I met Anita Roddick uh, uh, and uh, later Ray Anderson. And uh, for, for me, it was a they were leaders with a purpose, a larger purpose than just making money or uh, being uh, personally successful. They were out to change the world. And there's a, a current generation of them as well. Uh, that uh, are well recognized and, and now celebrated. Paul Pullman is now the pinup boy uh, on business managers' offices uh, rather than a Jack Welsh uh, uh, for his leadership as Unilever. Larry Fink at uh, BlackRock uh, got religion about uh, 10 years ago and uh, was actually led by a younger generation of leaders to embrace uh, uh, ESG and uh, sustainable finance and uh, enduring area and so on. So if you look at the, our framings of these things, there's a whole bunch of new concepts about leadership, some newer than others that have been uh, flapping around in the literature and in the popular press. And, uh, and you know, if I'd update my slide, it would be purpose-driven leaders now and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that it is clear what this, there's a, an emerging and directional perspective on what we're asking of leaders today and what we admire in leaders today. And, and and for whom? They're not just leading their companies or leading uh, for the sake of uh, uh, profitability. They're uh, leading for the sake of society, the environment, uh, and so on. Um, and with Sanders' guidance uh, early on, and uh, we sort of framed this in uh, responsible leadership as a product of the individual, how the individual operates and creates within the company, and how uh, the firm or enterprise, uh, whether uh, profit or not making, but not profit uh, operates in the ecology of commerce. The question I got in is how do you develop these leaders? Understanding that it, a lot of it is their internal development, a la Mandela. And uh, that's what I wanna talk about today. Uh, I've been involved in four different kinds of ventures that include leadership development. And I will show you some pictures and slides of what those look like. The leadership journeys where large groups of people go out and encounter the world. Uh, to raise their consciousness about what's happening. Service learning where they get their arms into the world and uh, actually try to uh, affect conditions on the ground. Uh, partnerships with social entrepreneurs where uh, the two different uh, commercial and a social entrepreneur work together to create a better world. And then real world sustainability and social change projects in business. And I've been lucky to go all around the world to do these kinds of things. Well, I'll give you the, the basic theory, and it, it's one that uh, certainly Steve and Sandra will recognize well. Uh, I got interested uh, when Bill Torbert began to write about this. He talked about horizontal development of people and vertical development of people. Horizontal development is kind of what you get in the MBA program, new knowledge, skills, et cetera, within your current mindset to develop your capabilities as an executive. Uh, it's limited. Uh, you know, there's a quote from Stephen Covey. It primarily works on your skill set rather than your mindset. And Bill talks about the idea of vertical development, transformation processes through individuals progress through their 
a sequence of worldviews and enhance and enlarge and enrich uh, their consciousness and perspective. And about, uh, Sandra mentioned to the desert and back, I hooked up, uh, you know, after reading these kinds of things and working with the Ben and Jerry's and the, and the erotics, I met a wild man, you know, an executive from uh, uh, Unilever, who was a follower of M. Scott Peck, who also had a great influence on me, and uh, also a Star Trek fan. He said, I want to go into consciousness. I want to expand my consciousness, and I'm hoping to expand the consciousness of my company. So Tex brought together a community of leaders and we went on a set of learning journeys, uh, journeys to see the world writ large. Uh, we went up to Scotland to look at how a, a, a clan works. Uh, we uh, had deep dialogues uh, about uh, the connection between the self and uh, uh, the spirit. Uh, we participated in a, uh, a dive in the North Sea with uh, uh, 200,000 customers uh, on New Year's Day uh, and traveled to Jordan uh, and Petra uh, as the, the story ends. Uh, and that was my kind of first exposure to getting out there, putting together a, a very deep and enriching set of experiences. And, and Tex then moved to Asia where he took over the Asia business. And learning journeys became a kind of annual event for individual and collective development. And the principles are pretty straightforward. You, you can read them here, but to engage the mind, heart, body, and soul, and to document them in a research process. And one of our first journeys was to Guilin to meet China. And uh, my job that uh, on one day was sweeping the streets with a uh, villager. Others were teaching in schools and so on. Uh, to connect to the consumers in China and the kids. And we camped together, shared stories, bonded. And then we met this man one morning. He's a uh, Tai Chi master. He was leading us in our uh, morning exercises. And one of the young leaders asked him, Master, how did you become a, uh, a master in your, your field? He said, please, please, uh, I'm not a master. I'm still learning. I'm uh, 82 years old and I have much to learn. And uh, they pressed him a little bit and he said, well, he said, understand with Tai Chi, first of all, you must know yourself. What are your capabilities? What is happening inside your life? What is happening uh, in your mind? Then you must know your opponent or your dance partner. Who are they? What are their skills? What are their gifts? Uh, and so on. Then you must be aware of the environment around you. Uh, if it's a fight, the, the winds and arrows and so on. If it's a dance, the music and the mood. And then he said, you must forget all of that and experience the chi. And, times. and that will guide you. And that's where we began to theorize these levels of consciousness, uh, learning from the master, the self, the other, the collective mind, and this universal consciousness of the chi. And the, that guided my practice. How can I help people develop at these four levels of consciousness? Now, one was still personal storytelling examining your life through a vehicle called emotional lifelines. So those of you who remember Herb Shepard developed the idea where you track your life history and the emotional highs and lows and what you might gain from that. And Howard Gardner talks about this in Leading Minds, uh, where he says it's a, obviously a story is a basic cognitive form. We think in stories and so on, but it's the particular burden of a leader to help individuals develop their identity stories, who I am, and so on. And that's how it got transposed into uh, this activity among executives in Nova Nordisk here, where the CEO is sharing his lifeline uh, with a group of leaders, telling the story of how he used to fight with his brother and how that makes him so competitive during business meetings and so on, sharing some of his trials and so on, and the emotional impact it had on the, the participants who also shared their identity stories.
Now these identity stories can go deep. Uh, I went with a group uh, called the AARP, the Australian Association of Retired Persons, where a group of uh, white elders and Aboriginal elders took their grandsons out on a journey around the Luru, which is the belly button of the world in the center of Australia. Uh, and as you travel around the rocks, you will see the story of the Aboriginal people carved in petroglyphs all around the rock. And the first day out, it was a miserable experience. Uh, children were angry because they couldn't have cell phones and uh, get on uh, YouTube and there was no reception. And uh, these adults were blah, 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 blah. By the third day, uh, as we reached the uh, backside of the rock, it was grandfather, tell us more of this story. And the storytelling can go in various ways. If you're an aesthetic like Steve Taylor, uh, why not, instead of looking in the mirror to see yourself, get a three-dimensional image? So we worked with a community artist named Maggie Sherman to make three-dimensional images uh, of who we are and decorate them and paint them and tell our story. This is a group of young executives at Ford Motor Company sharing their stories, decorating the mask to talk about what's behind the mask. Now moving up to the next level, connecting with the other. Now, when I started this, uh, EQ hadn't uh, become quite so fashionable, but now it's part of the, the parlance and training in uh, every uh, uh, development program from kindergarten to uh, business school. Uh, it's a capacity to not only understand the other intellectually, but to empathize with the other, but also connect to the other. And that's what we don't, we sometimes call SQ or spiritual intelligence, or if uh, you want to sanitize it, social intelligence. Well, here's a group of uh, leaders from uh, Nova Nordisk in Brazil, where we're connecting with their world. We visited uh, Dorina Noville, uh, the Center for the Blind uh, outside of Sao Paulo. And this is an interesting story. Dorina is an elderly woman. Uh, she was um, blinded at age 12 in uh, Sao Paulo and uh, her, her mother uh, said, well, you must go to the countryside and uh, live a simpler life. The city's too complicated and dangerous for you. Uh, but before she left, the woman came to talk in uh, Brazil named, uh, um, who's the great, uh, you'll have to help me with this, uh, the great blind lady, Helen Keller. Helen Keller spoke and, and Dorina, this is her daughter here, went up to talk to her and Helen said, she told her story to Helen and Helen said, no, you mustn't go to the countryside. You must be Helen Keller uh, of Brazil. And that's who she was. And we spent this day working with the blind, understanding their life and so on. Other journeys we've gone to find indigenous knowledge. Uh, here we're working with a group of, in the lower uh, corner, uh, the shamans in Paraguay, and up above uh, a group of uh, the Penan people in uh, Indonesia to learn about indigenous wisdom. And then there's the sharing with one another. And with an audience like this, you, you know, of course, there's structured techniques for conversations to speed it up and make it more efficient, but there's also uh, conversational techniques to slow it down to get people to dialogue deeply. And that's one of the things I learned from working with Scott Peck, where a key emphasis uh, in, in an ancient tradition, as well as among the Quakers, is to empty yourself, to free yourself of all the noise and let the spirit uh, speak through you. And those were the conversations we had uh, after these encounters in Sao Paulo and so on. And these were the conversations we had in Indonesia. And then we also had these very quiet conversations with the self. And even carrying it out to what the action implications might be. Now moving up to the third level of consciousness, how do you see the whole and connect to the world? And for me, it's not, uh, in these many of these contexts, it's not simply, uh, wow, uh, <clears throat> look at those waterfalls. It's what does this mean for us 
uh, as business leaders. Now we know there's plenty of material on the business as the problem. There's also a growing set of material on business as a solution. So the objective of these meetings is to not only raise consciousness, but also motivate action toward a better world. This was an interesting project with some uh, uh, high finance guys from uh, Britain. In Dubai, which has become a deep financial center in the uh, Middle East, but to see the old economy. We visited with spice traders, we visited with uh, uh, camel drivers, and we visited the modern economy. Uh, and it was interesting, uh, uh, I won't tell you the name of the company, but after this journey, there was so much blowback about the business model. They said, uh, we're not going to do another one of these. Now, these don't have to be exotic in uh, transnational places. This is a group of meetings in Detroit where we visited uh, the new Green Detroit project to create urban farming uh, with so much available uh, uh, landscape that uh, where the housing has been removed. We visited Shinola, an interesting company that uh, makes high-end watches in Detroit uh, and employs the out-of-work automobile workers who've been laid off as well as young black and minority uh, kids where they can learn the high craft trade. Another journey took us to Greenland. This was a group of uh, DBA students where we met Meta Ling, an indigenous artist. Some of my people are col colonists. Some of them want to be uh, Danish. I know myself. I know my own truth. And she talked about how she's resurrecting the craft of carving among indigenous peoples in Greenland. And as participants, we did some carving. Now the trip to Brazil, this time working with kids, helping to refine the mission statement of a company. which ultimately translated into a global campaign. Now, you know the facts about the environment. It's important to see them. Uh, another trip to uh, Sarawak introduced us to uh, palm oil. And from this came a whole new set of commitments of companies to do 100% sustainable palm oil. The Greenland glaciers. The falls of Iguazu. All of these to kind of help companies to feel, experience, and see with, even within themselves the natural world. And if you want to go even deeper into that, you can join our friend uh, Derek de Jong in uh, South Africa where we went out and spent a day with elephants, slept alongside them, learned how they see their world, just as best we could. You know the social facts. And that's often led me to work on service learning projects. And there's an interesting group in uh, Washington, D.C. named Pixar Global that uh, helps companies to send their uh, young leaders of all ages on service learning assignments around the world work in indigenous communities and it raises lots of questions. What should we do with these tribes? Do we leave them alone? Well, I'm afraid Nike's already there. So what do you want to do? How can we help them? And this group is working on COVID vaccines now among these peoples. Tanzania, we took a group of service workers from IBM down to see uh, uh, young entrepreneurs working on uh, digitizing uh, their business, musicians and so on. Another trip to India, we had CK lead us in <clears throat> base of the pyramid investments. Doing community service in the hills of Vietnam. 
you can see as these experiences get internalized, people begin to develop stories and perspectives about who they are, who they want to be, uh, and uh, ultimately translating that into business activities. And yes, there are good uses of uh, bullshit. Uh, it's, it's powering this home. Which uh, also raises the question of kind of what's going to be your legacy? What will you leave behind? Some of the most powerful experiences we've had of coming in and with disaster relief. There's the tsunami uh, that struck and uh, we're listening to the fears and hopes of mothers and children in Sri Lanka. Simply sharing our spirit with them made incredible differences, not only to their lives, but also to our own. It continues to surprise me how care and service for others helps me to discover my own love. Sometimes these are difficult and complex situations. Took a group of people from Seattle in the midst of the crises of the Brent Spar and the arrest and ultimately execution of Ken Sarawiva. And we worked through that and then the question came, well, how can you continue to work in this kind of a company, this, this sort of an industry and so on? So they had what was the equivalent of an inspection and reassessment and uh, recommitment uh, among key leaders. And we went to Barcelona to see how Gaudi created a new world through imagination, an organization. And in Guelph Park, people were painting their tombstones. What will the future say about me? What legacy will I leave behind? And telling their stories this way. And you know some of the things she all did. It's certainly uh, not a perfect company along the way. So that's the theory of the case and what it looks like put into practice and so on. And I'll, I'll leave it with this one uh, because when we think about the messages from leaders, this was a in particularly interesting one in Vietnam where we met with the North Vietnamese general who shared his story. What it was like fighting what he called the American war. Listening to Sergio tell his story. Or in a more recent venture, working with some folks to tell stories and have experiences. These are young people working for a pharmaceutical company. So we spent a day with chefs cooking and comparing notes on the chemistry. We spent another day uh, carving ice, another day improv theater, and another day meeting a mountain climber who has no arms or legs. Now these are folks, uh, probably half from, not from the US, but they graduated from community colleges and so on. For them, this experience was mind blowing and enriching. And these kinds of activities are now being sponsored all over the place. That's enough for now. So thank you, Phil. That was that really shows the breadth of what you you have accomplished over many years. Um, I want to. Um, I've got a couple. Qu there's some questions in the uh, in the chat that I want to get to, but I want to ask you a couple questions myself first. And they're totally not what I was going to ask you originally, um, <laughs> because they're triggered by what you just presented. So you've written a ton about consciousness raising, um, and you're really speaking about it. Um, can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by raising consciousness, and how does it actually happen? What is it? What What is it about these experiences that generates this openness, a new awareness, or consciousness raising? Well, I, I think it's a, to me, it's a, obviously the, 
the phenomenon itself has a thousand different perspectives. My particular take on it is that it is that that the conscious that it is the consciousness is there, uh, but it's often repressed or dormant or un under stimulated. And the, the, the aim of these activities is to create in a reasonably safe way a set of experiences that jar you. Now they may create wonder and awe. They may create shame. Uh, they may create a, uh, uh, a distance. Uh, they may create an invitation to come in, but it, it is an unsettling, uh, you know, you could use a, a very old but uh, a very uh, thoughtful term, is it unfreezes wherever you are. And uh, it, to the extent these experiences are rich and diverse and so on, they, they themselves have a quality that resonates with you. It triggers uh, internally. Uh, emotions, um, potentially uh, uh, your uh, blood cells, etc., uh, etc., et et in, in ways that, uh, in a very uh, human, deeply human way, uh, open us uh, to new possibilities. And the idea of doing it together rather than uh, a solo experience is twofold. One is, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not a chaplain. I'm not a, uh, a therapist. I, I'm not here just for you. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to facilitate a group of people to enrich their collective mindset and to do something with it. It's not just growth for growth's sake, it's growth to do better in the world and, or, or, and do good in the world. And that's where the, the company of others, uh, the engagement of uh, uh, the leaders in this process, uh, and the, uh, uh, we don't just end and say, wow, that was great. Let's go back into the cubicle. It's no, what are we going to do differently now? What are the action plans? What are the commitments we make? Uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, in some businesses, what are the key metrics we're going to uh, uh, rate ourselves on going forward? Uh, and that's where it moves from a, simply an educational experience to a change experience. There, there's also something here about, well, there's two things that, that are striking. One is simply the experience of being in nature and being in touch with nature in new ways. And the other is connecting with people and telling your story and maybe having that story heard in a way that has probably never been heard before. Yes, yeah, very well said. Very well said. Yeah, now, now I want to emphasize the reason I, I showed you the picture of the ice carving and this and that is, you know, nature is a powerful teacher be sure. And being out there away from the business is extraordinary to be sure. Uh, ice carving is, is that uh, it, it, not that full experience, but it, it is a way for a group of people in a very practical uh, and cross-conscious world to take a moment, try something new, be with another, and their particular emphasis was to rediscover the craftsmanship of their business that we're not just you know we're making drugs so that's good work but it's the making that we're not talking about here what is the craft of this and how do we begin to experience and respect one another as craftsmen and craftswomen and so on and and that was the theme of this particular experience and i've never done this before so it was, it was very interesting and i ended up making uh, with the uh, french bakers uh, one of the worst looking uh, souffles you can imagine <laughs> <laughs> but they were good at it reminds me of when i years ago when we revised our mba program um we had our students start the program by building these towers out of newspaper and masking well, tape. Sure. and um and it was just such an incredible experience for bringing people together. It's that same kind of way of connecting. So let me, there's a whole bunch of interesting questions. So let me um, turn to Anil uh, Maheshwari, who has a question for you. Anil, you want to unmute yourself if you're still here, of course. Yes, I'm here. Um, thank you, Phil. Um, I appreciate your very uh, deep work. And I was wondering, I mean, you start with the roots. So what do you do to get to the answer? Let's say, who am I? You meditate what kind of so can you tell a little bit about 
your own ways to coming to first term and raise your own consciousness before you can. Yeah, Al, that's, that's a very difficult question. I, I, I watch my wife meditate and that's helpful. Yeah, <laughs> she, she's a, uh, it's a, it's been a difficult journey for me to sort of say, can I also live this uh, deep reflective experience? And uh, I'm not as disciplined uh, as I would uh, aspire to be. Uh, I, I do three things. One is I walk. So I do take a, a regular walk and uh, I think I can do this. So there's, there's my backyard. Can you see that? Yeah. Probably not. Yes. <laughs> I live out in, uh, I've now moved to an environment that is rich in nature in Austin, Mexico. So I walk in the mountains, I, I see the sheep, uh, uh, listen to the coyotes, uh, uh, meet the ravens every morning and so on. So that, that's a part of my emotional center. Uh, second is I talk. Uh, and and uh, the other part of that is I listen. And that was the uh, work experience I had with uh, M. Scott Peck and, and others was to bring people together in conversational circles where you do, you, you tell your story just as you would in AA or uh, 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 I suppose on Facebook, uh, but more importantly, you listen to other stories. And that storytelling uh, not only enriches my story, it helps me to tap into the, the larger stories. Uh, that I hear. Uh, so that's the second way. And I, I suppose the third thing I do is I eat. Um, I, I sort of try lots of different uh, foods uh, just to, to sort of uh, stimulate my palate. Uh, and uh, ironically, that palate stimulation, uh, I think, uh, gives me a better sense of taste and smell. And uh, you probably know uh, Sumantra Ghoshal, and I always asked him, uh, you know, how do you diagnose the situation? He says, I, I get the smell of the place. Uh, that's where I start. So, I, 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 you know, I wish I could tell you I was deeply meditative and introspective. Uh, not so. Mine is much more physical and uh, uh, sort of uh, cerebral engagement uh, to en enrich and enlarge my consciousness uh, to the extent it is such. <laughs> Um, and Sue, you have a number of questions. Would you like to raise up a couple of them? Ann? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Sandra, very much for giving me the time. I have so many questions, I don't know where to begin. But I guess I'll begin by thanking Phil for sharing with us your awesome work. It's incredible work you're doing, influencing so many, many people around the world and helping us to be more conscious about who we are and how better can we all be? Uh, so my, my first question uh, uh, is this, uh, uh, I, I, I hope I didn't miss it, but I was curious about whether you have done any work with academic leaders, uh, such as uh, university leadership, uh, especially business school leaders, deans, and also perhaps I'm thinking about journal editors who are leaders also, because they they're, if they, think about being responsible leaders. I suspect they'll lead their schools and edit their journals in quite different ways. Uh, so I'm, I'm just curious whether you have, if you have, please uh, please um, share with, with us. And if not, why not? <laughs> then... <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So I, I mean, first of all, let me give a plug for your good work in, uh, in the uh, responsible uh, uh, research and business uh, bringing together academic leaders. And Sandra also has talked about difference makers and shamans of, of academics. Um, I, I had a strange experience with academia. I entered it in the same way I left it, fired with enthusiasm. Uh, so I, I, I had a, uh, I didn't have a great experience uh, in leaving academia. So I sort of said, I'm getting away from this. And, and frankly, I, I do think there is something about the ivory tower, not the students, though that's a, partly an issue, but the ivory tower uh, is there to uh, maintain tradition. I like to work with people who want to try uh, establish new traditions, to put it as as possible. Uh, so when I was with Ben and Jerry, it's, we don't want to become uh, 
General Motors. <laughs> we don't want to become Pillsbury. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're fighting a doughboy. We, we have a whole different business model. I want to make a big change in the world, uh, and so on. And uh, from that platform, uh, I mean, my initial perception, I, I, I don't have an MBA, and my initial perception of business leaders was a, sort of long teeth and talons. And uh, as you get in, you discover just as much diversity as you do everywhere else. And lots of characters who uh, not only uh, want to express their soul, but in their leadership, bring forth a large of souls. And uh, uh, most of the companies I work with have, have been of that type. Now, you know, and, and for me, that's the, that's moves the needle in ways that, and, and more immediately than uh, it would in the academic context. Um, so it, uh, but that, that said, I think I built a, uh, with Jim Walsh at the University of Michigan, we created a, uh, an altar enshrined to Kim, Kim Cameron, and that was a weird day. <laughs> so I have had a, a little work with uh, uh, fellow traveler academics. Well, thank you so much for sharing. It is um, it's a bit disheartening because I think what you're telling me is that academics are very resistant to change. And that's my experience too. So, but, <laughs> but we have to uh, we have to keep pushing. Um, so, Sandra, I don't want to take all the time. So, I, I'll, if that's time, you can come back to me. L allow me to ask them other questions. And uh, let, let's give the time to other other okay. participants. Okay. You're thanks, fighting, Anne. Fighting, um, a good, fighting a good fight, Anne. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what, your work on the responsible research is amazing. Um, uh, David Boja, you had a question. Hey, was in New Mexico. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, Grace Ann Rosil is here too. She's uh, just <laughs> hey, hi Grace. How you doing? Uh, uh, should, have, should have got woke up Mary Jo. She's in the back. <laughs> oh, hi Mary Jo. Hey, I'm really happy about your talk, and I wanted you to say a little bit more about um, Walter Benjamin wrote about how storytelling is coming to an end because in corporations and in the industrial revolution. They don't let us sing at work anymore, and they put us in cubicles, and they they feed us these these drab narratives to memorize. So we're not really doing the work of storytelling, where we learn the skills. And I thought your presentation was so excellent about bringing back the skills and how we might learn the relearn the skills forgotten. So that's my question. Yeah, well, I, th I, th I think you, you know, David, in some ways you were ahead of your time talking about the importance of stories in organization life. Uh, uh, just a, a bit of a story. I, I uh, in the late, late 80s, early, I went up and with, spent a summer with Peter Frost and his colleagues at the University of British Columbia. And uh, Peter is a, uh, an intellectual shaman as well as a healer uh, as a human being. And we had a wonderful conference on organizational culture. And uh, we sang worker songs. And one of the questions uh, that got surfaced by a very clever participant is, how come there are no songs about management? And uh, that sort of started and sparked a whole set of discussion of what happened to song and, uh, and, and so on. And I would say uh, part of the outgrowth of the culture movement was uh, th this notion that yes, you must tell your story, that uh, culture doesn't reduce to a survey and uh, easily uh, with a set of metrics on a, a spatial map that it's embodied in and embedded in stories. And that was certainly the experience in uh, Uluru with the uh, uh, elders and their, their grandchildren. Um, so there were programs on how to tell your story, et cetera, et cetera. And as I moved into social innovation about 2010, I began to see, uh, okay, well, you know, this sounds like innovation with a good purpose. Is there something different here? And as you get into it, you say, well, this seems to have a social component in terms of a, you know, the, there's a number of people involved in the innovation. There's a, a social process to it. Uh, there's design thinking, which of course no one had ever heard of, uh, who uh, uh, just as we never heard of employee engagement, you know, it's a new term for an old phenomena uh, and so on. But uh, what was interesting was, okay, that's that, 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 I see all that. That's very familiar. Uh, and then, but what about your pitch to investors? And how, what about your pitch to young people? How do you learn to tell that story? And suddenly there were television shows on this. 
and, and so on. And, and so there's a whole new generation who are, are telling business stories. And you've got storyboards, <laughs> I'll tell my story, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's not just a commercial story because the second rap on it was in, was purpose. So I have to tell a story that's not only uh, intellectually convincing, uh, but emotionally appealing and, and somehow represents our larger purpose. Now, uh, you know, I, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, they work against that kind of storytelling. Uh, but uh, if, if you go to a, a boot camp, innovation boot camp, uh, it's storytelling 101. Um, Marilyn Doramal, you have both a comment and I think a, an interesting question. Would you like to unmute and ask Phil? Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. Good, yeah. I work with uh, Leah. Thank you very much for the very informative uh, lecture you have. But I, I work with leaders. And uh, my question, my I'm curi curious about things. I've learned a lot from your answers for Anil and David. It's more or less my question is the same as that. But uh, I work so much with the technical people. And I think the struggle is to encourage them to do more self-awareness. That's why I was talking about what strategies can we use to encourage them to come up with the skills of storytelling mm -hmm. and uh, being self-aware. Because uh, maybe at the start, but sustaining the same has been a struggle. So no, I, I was curious. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I was curious about what else can we do to uh, make this more, more of a part maybe of their exercise on self-awareness? No, that's interesting. So uh, you may know Phil Alf, the late Phil Alfonso, uh, Marilyn from uh, Asian Management Institute in Manila. Um, I, I spent a couple of uh, years sort of in and out with Phil as he worked and watched him teach. And what he would, he, he taught a program among for technical uh, technicians, really. Uh, he would bring senior figures into the room uh, who were uh, uh, existential engineers. They had a philosophy, they had a larger purpose, and they would tell their life story, how they got into this work. Uh, and, you know, they didn't uh, shy away from the technical discussions and so on, but they would always lift it up into a larger story of, uh, of who they were, what they were trying to accomplish in the world, and the craft. And I, I must tell you, when, when I first started my, uh, my career uh, consulting with business, you know, I'd been in academe where you, the, the role model was the sage on the stage. And I said, well, I, I have really interesting stories. I can tell these uh, uh, young leaders in business, and I can tell them in the uh, DBA program and so on. And, and I, I would do that. They'd be great talks. And then I'd watch their leaders get up in front of them. And I mean, the attention level, the interest, the emotional connection just went up 100%. Uh, percent. And I, it sort of dawned on me, what the hell am I talking to people for? What, how, how can I create a space in the setting where their leaders can speak deeply and humanly? And uh, wow. Uh, and I, I must say that uh, one of my friends and colleagues who is not universally admired, Noel Tishi, used to say, you know, when some of the professors uh, get on the stage, their job is to tell them, tell you, to demonstrate that they're the smartest person in the room. My job when I get on, on the stage is to get you to think you're the smartest person in the world. And that has always struck with me. So I, you know, I, while I'm delighted to do this talk virtually and love to hear my own voice, I, ne I don't do talk much in front of executives. I try to set a table and a space where uh, their leaders can speak to them. And if not their leaders, and this was Phil's gift, a, a, a role model that doesn't exist in, that they have never met. Who could inspire them? And, and the hook for the technical people was immediate. And, and you know, this was you know, obviously their individual differences and maybe stratifications by occupation. But uh, in my experience, technicians also have hearts and souls. Uh, and when properly uh, called forth, it, it, it just reverberates. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Phil. I, I know that the engineers also have hearts and souls. They're just so, you know, focused on the technical things. But thank you very much for that. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Marty Shoemaker. Thank you, Marty. Thank you very much. I, uh, I'm kind of new to this group. I've been attending for a couple of years. I'm a Canadian uh, psychologist that's semi-retired now, done some of the work that Phil has done with corporations, tried to work with some of our indigenous groups. They're not always real receptive to uh, old white guys like me, which I understand. Uh, but I've now uh, started an encore career, Phil, which is I'm a humanist chaplain and I'm working in a university, but I want to start stimulating young people who are interested in chaplaincy, maybe in a secular format, to work in inside organizations and do some of this uh, spiritual kind of meaning work, uh, not just with individuals, but in groups. And I'm wondering if there is a program that you've run across anywhere in the world that's leveraging some kind of spiritual chaplaincy, be it religious or secular, to grow companies in these ethical and uh, consciousness raising endeavors. Is there a program that you have run across? I'd love to have their name and connect with them. Well, I'll have to, I'll have to dig a little bit, Marty, but I, I, my sense of it is, uh, and let me just secularize that it's a cottage industry. So that uh, in this group, the Foundation of Community Encouragement with M. Scott Peck, we had a number of facilitators that would do community building workshops. Okay. And uh, businesses would get interested in this. I mean, this was one of the original hooks for uh, Tex Gunning, from Unilever. Um, and it, uh, you know, if they, the particular process is a, a collective dialogue over multiple days. Um, uh, it, it's not dissimilar to uh, uh, the old T group or an Esalen model, uh, but it's more similar to uh, uh, the ancient gathering of the tribe in Akiva to mm -hmm. share stories uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and I, I've seen a lot of work uh, episodically in the spirituality and business and done my own sort of thinking and writing about soul work in business. Um, okay. but, but I think it, ha it packaged in that way, um, it either is sold as a kind of EAP or personal growth program. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if you, uh, you can say, well, who's interested in personal growth and the, you know, the number one course on uh, the Khan Academy is how to be happy. Uh, you know, it's huge. Uh, but to, to spiritualize it, I think, uh, takes a particular uh, executive and, and actually to walk, uh, walk a careful line. Uh, because, uh, well, you know, it, uh, it, perhaps the most fraught thing that can come up, come up in the discussion of a diverse group of people is what do you think of Trump? The next yeah. most fraught thing is uh, do, don't you think Jesus has all the answers? Uh, yeah. It takes a while to sort of get beyond that into the, the deeper questions that are surfaced. Yeah. Perhaps Sandra or you could give me your email and I could uh, kind of correspond with you a little bit. And I'd like to follow up on the UBC prof that you talked, that conference you talked about at University of British Columbia. Yeah, well, that's well. Um, yeah, Marty, just email me. I'll, I'll put my email into the uh, chat in a minute. Okay, thanks, Sandra. Um, Steve Clapp, you had a comment. I don't know if you want to elaborate that and ask a question. Yeah, thanks very much, um, Sandra. Um, <clears throat> Phil, it, it's uh, you know good to hear you speak, and it was very mind opening. And I think that's kind of the, the the crux of my observation is, you know, to what extent do you feel that opening your mind and you know, being being empathetic to everything around you or and and what's going on inside you as well is maybe one of the major keys or themes to um to what it is that you're you know that you're promoting yeah well I, i'd say a, a couple of things one is i, I know i uh, uh you know it's, when you see the falls or iguazu or in my case take a walk out and see the uh, big horn sheep coming down it's powerful uh, but i also have a, uh, a grandson who just uh, puts his head on the earth 
and uh, because he learned this at school where their job is to listen to mother earth uh, that kind of simple discipline and simple practice to me is extraordinary um, I, I also think that there's a kind of preciousness that I, I struggle with. Well, you know, here I am in Taos where, uh, for instance, where winter, spring, summer, fall is here in thousands of forms. Of, you know, we can do it with crystals, we can do it with rocks, we can do it, we can, we can find that inner life for you, uh, and both as a communal experience and for $70 an hour, $150 an hour, you get a private session uh, to, to find who you really are. Um, and uh, I got a real sort of pushback on this uh, with the indigenous peoples, because, uh, you know, as you read the so many books, if only we could go back to the good times when uh, uh, you know, Aboriginal people were so deeply connected to the earth and the, 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 the chimps and the, and the, the uh, gorillas with the, this gentleness uh, lived uh, uh, such a holistic and full life. And, and then uh, when you watch the Navajo uh, brutally attack the Pueblo people and the chimps devour one of their weak uh, members, you sort of say, wait a minute, we're go we're, we are romanticizing this beyond uh, 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 what's really happening in the world. So uh, my opening in consciousness is not just to find the warm, fuzzy, uh, and deep uh, spiritual connections, but also to see the wrathful God. Uh, to see the God that allows uh, the horrible things to happen and, and to see in, within ourselves, if you will, the baser instincts and so on. Uh, and and that, that for me is both part of my own process, but also I think part of, of, of uh, confronting executives, uh, not only with uh, are, are you guys uh, ravaging the earth, but why are you treating each other like chimps ready to devour one another? And it's, it's confronting those darker uh, and, and more baser instincts that, and, and behaviors that uh, is tricky and uh, makes this less a romantic journey and more uh, a real journey. Uh, so, Phil, I, I think we have a lot of great questions still, but I think uh, we have time for one more. Um, I'm going to turn to Jim Walsh. Okay, Jim. Actually, it, it, it's directly related to what you just said about the darker world. I was just reflecting on how profound and deep and centered this work is with these organizations. Um, and there's the, the question about how uh, whatever emerges from this commingles with their everyday life of doing business, making money, search for competitive advantage and all of that, as well as the fact that you are being paid to do this and they know yeah. you're being paid to do this. And so there's, um, I guess I'm more interested, I, we know a fair bit about how firms deal with these kinds of sensibilities, perhaps, or we think we do, but what's it like for you as you're doing this work? Uh, and it's, it's true for, you, for ministers and therapists and everybody else, but, but you know, you're being paid to do this and yet it's also, deep. does this compromise the work in some way, animate it? Or is this just the nature of reality and uh, we live in both worlds simultaneously and get over it, <laughs> grasshopper, <laughs> this is how the, how the world works. <laughs> but that's often be. Yeah, 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 it's interesting. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of the economics of this, um, there's a, uh, there's two things to say. One, one is, uh, you know, when I show some of these journeys to Jordan and this and that, people, the executive says, my God, what did that cost? And I said, well, what do you think your golf outing cost last year? you know, with the booze and the trophies and the this and the that and the other thing, you know, so let's get real about that. Now, I would not say this is a way for me personally to get rich. Uh, where I do better financially, to be truthful, is when it's nested in a context of a, an established executive development program, this and that. Uh, but I, I don't do much of that. Uh, I usually do it uh, with an executive that you know, wants to lead the journey forth. So I, 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 you know, I, I'm not paid enough to feel completely compromised and, and I've never been put in a situation of having to uh, sort of act out uh, a particular role or, or, or sidelined with, with a couple of exceptions where I either self-censored, just you know, there's no point in throwing this shit against the wall now. Uh, it's gonna sort of make me feel better but not uh, be helpful to the situation or, or a case where I felt someone was injured. I would ask the, the, I would say the other thing that struck me in my most recent work is we had people uh, six months after uh, talk about uh, where they were now in their lives. 
and I must say, reading it, uh, it wasn't like fan mail. It was, uh, I'm doing this differently with my spouse, or I'm doing different this new thing in my community, or, uh, not, you know, the other day when I had one of these events where I normally would do this, I, I tried this thing, and so on. And to see this incorporated into everyday practice, that you you never see as a professor unless you, you sort of stay connected to your students. And, and I never see, you know, I, I mean, I read the top line and see the stories and maybe the posts, but I never see how it shows up in people's everyday behavior. And boy, that was rich in the front of me. Yeah. Oh, um, I, I want, I also, uh, if you will indulge me, Cindy, I want to give a shout out to, I think I mentioned my friend Ken Pasternak, but also to David Zuka, who does such good work. And that's just whom I can see on your, on your board. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I, unfortunately, although there's some great questions still in the chat, um, we I have run out of time. So I want to thank everybody for attending and thank Phil in particular for um, this wonderful talk. There have been a lot of positive comments in the chat too, Phil, in addition to all the questions. Um, so we will save the questions. And um, Erica, is there any final thing you need to say, want to say? Nothing final I need to say other than thank you. So nice to see you all. And we look forward to, to seeing everyone again as we move forward. Phil, thank you very much, Sandra. My pleasure, thanks for, thanks for welcoming me. Thank you, Phil. And uh, everyone stay safe and healthy. Okay. Bye, all. Bye everyone.